yet. You may have seen uh, some of the little children running around. Uh, two of them belong to us. Uh, they bear a likeness to Jill and I. If you know us, you'll see it in them. Uh, if not, we can point some of the features out. So-and-so's eyes, another's mouth, uh, sometimes someone's attitude. Uh, we'll see even beyond the physical likeness, there is a personality likeness. Uh, tastes and preferences go through the children. No one's going to doubt the authenticity of their origins. They are our children. Uniquely identified, little bits of Stoner and Moffat from Jill's side, little bits of Maddock and Stringham and Yarnell coming from my side. They are my kids. Uh, one of them can be dreamy while she's awake. You have to rouse and get her attention. The other one can't keep her attention for more than a few minutes and is easily distracted. I won't say which one follows which one of the parents, but let's just say that living with them has identified them as my children. There is no question they come from Jill and I. We can go one generation back for my own family, and I find that as I'm getting older and I'm maturing, that I open my mouth and I hear my father speak more and more. There'll be something on the news, some foolishness. And I open my mouth and then dad talks right out of my mouth. And I find that that's not a bad thing to be finding the characteristics of my father in me. He is a man to be honored. I do wonder if, if my father and I would live for a hundred years. How much more like him would I be? We'd have more time together. I'd have more time to to see what he's like and for him to have an impact in how I am? What if we lived for a thousand years? A thousand years, like they did in the old days when you could get up into the nine hundreds of years. I wonder if Methuselah had sons that were an awful lot like him because they'd had so much time together. My brothers and sisters, do you know that we are the children of God? Amen. Of God. Not merely of, of the earthly parents, the physical do we bear their resemblance? Yes. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Depends on what flows down that genetic river that we are at the, the end of. But we're the children of God. We have been adopted. We have been remade. We have been born again, born from above. Do you know that we bear his characteristics because we are his children? Do you know that the time is coming when we will have every tomorrow to explore our likeness to him? every tomorrow. Even if that tomorrow should be that we leave here and we die, even if that tomorrow means that he comes and we go to be with him, we have all of eternity to see what our likeness to our Heavenly Father, just what that means. Our text that we're focusing on this morning is 1 John chapter 3. If you have your scriptures, please turn there. 1 John chapter 3, the verse 3 verses. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Amen. First John's already been referenced once this morning in Brother Gene's message. Uh, First John is a book full of knowledge. The we know, we know, we know. John is such a, a compact uh, epistle. He doesn't give a lot of explanation. He gives, this is the way it is. Those that belong to God are walking in the light. Those that don't belong to God, they walk in the darkness. And all the way through, he has these very simple vocabulary, but he puts these things close together. So again, look at the text more closely. What manner of love the Father's bestowed upon us, or one of the paraphrases has lavished upon us. I kind of like that. That he's, he's not only said, you can be kind of like me. Here, this is what my holiness is like. Here's a book like Leviticus. You just follow this and you'll be, you'll be like me. You'll be similar to me. He has bestowed so much love upon us that we are, we are his children. And not only will be in the future, but even are now. This is what's woven together in this text. The, the what you have now and the what you'll have then. And, and they work together. 
It's not one likeness to him now and another likeness to him then. He is one. He's not changing. He's not divided. So that image that's in us now of him that's growing and growing, it'll come to that full blossom in that world to come. Amen. The world knows us not because it knew him not. That, by the way, is, is a good barometer on how you're doing and your likeness to the Lord. Does the world know you? Does the world listen to you? Be careful. Be careful. It didn't know the Lord Jesus and it didn't listen to him. And if he's our elder brother, we are to bear his likeness. Amen. Because all the fullness of the God had dwelt in him in bodily form. If you, he, so much Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now we in our measure, we come along and we want to be able to say with Paul, be an imitator of me as I imitate Christ. Be a follower of me as I follow Christ. Again, verse 2, now are we the sons of God, but yet th there is this form issue, and that's really what we're addressing this morning, the form that we're in, still in the bodies of clay, still wearing the imprint of our father Adam, still in that form. That form hasn't changed. The vessel is filled that was empty. We have been born again, born from above. We are renewed by his spirit in the inner man. We have put on the new man, put off the old man. There is a change, but it is not corporal. There's not a change in our form, in our body yet, and that's what is promised here. It, it pleases me that John, uh, by the Holy Spirit, admits it doth not yet appear what we shall be. There's no picture in the margin of my scripture. So this is what you're going to look like. There's, there's some reference to it. It'll still be you. It'll still be you. Not a loss of identity. Amen. But how does this happen? How, how is it that the change is going to happen in us? It's when he shall appear. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Why? For we shall see him as he is. For now, we don't see him as he is. We have our measure we have a testimony of the word. We have the spirit of God dwelling in us. But there is not yet that fullness. But when that fullness comes, then we shall be like him. Amen. And then there is a, the pragmatic uh, element in verse 3. Every man that has this hope in him, every man that has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. So if you're seeing what the end of your path is, that you're going to be like God, so much so the children of God, to be like Christ in fullness, then you're going to be moving toward that goal even right now. You will be purifying yourself. Amen. Weymouth translated this. See what marvelous love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called God's children. And that is what we are. For this reason, the world does not recognize us because it has not known him. Dear friends, we are now God's children, but what we are to be in the future has not yet been fully revealed. We know that if Christ appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And every man who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself so as to be as pure as he is. Amen. Here's a very ancient uh, reference from Augustine, early in the 400s from his book on the Confessions. Listen for the language of the Song of Songs in here. He borrows some language from that Song of Solomon. Thy word remaineth forever, which now appeareth unto us in the dark image of the clouds and through the glass of the heavens, not as it is. Because we also, although we be the well-beloved of thy Son, yet it hath not yet appeared what we shall be. He looketh through the lattice of our flesh, and he is fair speaking, and hath inflamed us, and we run after his odors, his perfume beckons us. But when he shall appear, then we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As he is, O Lord, shall we see him, although the time be not yet. And as that image of courtship and that, that longing of the marriage to come is captured there by Augustine, how appropriate it is for us that, that we see him through the lattice work, but what we see we like. And we want to be drawn to him and to chase after our beloved. This hope that is mentioned in here, every man that has this hope fixed on him, verse 3, this is a threefold hope 
the, the hope of his appearing, the hope of seeing him, the hope of being like him. Now this is a threefold hope that only we have, all three, those that are in Christ. Uh, there are some uh, that may want to see Jesus come back out of sheer novelty or boredom, but they do not have the hope of being like him. They just want to have something different happen on the earth. We are becoming more and more like our Heavenly Father, the one who has given us the new image in Christ. Steady growth in this likeness here on earth. But you may find there are times when the fact that we have a Heavenly Father is not so evident. You may find in your life from your own parents that you bear certain things from them, maybe a quick temper, maybe a predispensation for this or that, that is not really something you want to inherit. Everybody wants to inherit height or broad shoulders or so on. There's other things you can inherit as well. But we have this heavenly Father. And there are those who know you that will say, You, you a child of God. If you're a child of God, how come you still? And then they'll fill in the blank with whatever it is. Or if they've known you for some time, they'll say, What about when you used to? Or I remember when. You a child of God? I don't see the heavenly Father at work in you. Our present conditions may be weak and at times very disappointing to ourselves and, and I trust also to the Lord because he desires better things for us as well. But let me remind you that the doubting Thomas was transformed when he appeared. When Jesus came in, you don't read of doubting Thomas after that. The Thomas you read of in the early traditions is a Thomas that died a martyr's death trying to reach the lost. The lost. Mary and Martha's grief dissolved when he appeared. The leper was cleansed when he appeared. The woman taken in the very act of adultery was saved when he appeared. That makes a difference. And whatever the condition is before then, not to justify Thomas, not to excuse uh, Martha's busyness in the kitchen, not to uh, try and say that somehow their grief was inappropriate, not to say that the leper should have cleansed himself better. He should have done a better job. Not to say that the woman taken in adultery, it was okay what she was doing. Not at all. But to say every one of those circumstances changed permanently when he appeared. The arrival of Jesus in the Gospels always makes the difference. Always makes the difference. Have you ever wondered why there's, there's four of them and why this record as it comes down to us, this is how you start out. This is the foundation. This is what Jesus is like. Matthew, this is what Jesus is like. Mark, this is what Jesus is like. Luke, this is what Jesus is like. John, you have it over and over again. And then the epistles are unpacking the significance of that life and what really happened at the cross and the full weight of the atonement and so on. But you start out with that core of him. This is what God in flesh is like. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. There are times when life here is like a playground. It's like a playground. You might be getting picked on. You might have physical bullies. Some of you are young enough that that might be still an issue. I don't know. Some of you might work in places where that's actually an issue. I don't know. Still have physical bullies. Others, it might be people who are just mean and ugly to be around. Might have those kind of bullies. I think scripture permits the idea of there being also the aspect of spiritual bullies. And I think I know the one who is the chief bully of the children of God. The devil, the devil that walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But you know what changes the circumstance when one of the children is being picked on? What changes the whole dynamics of the playground? It's when the big brother gets there. That's when everything changes. The bullies flee when the big brother arrives. And brethren, the devil may be picking on you, but our big brother is coming. And it may be bad in the playground. It's not fun. But there is one who's coming that will change all the dynamics of the playground. And suddenly those who are the tail will not be the tail anymore. Brother A.T. Robertson wrote, The transforming power of this vision of Christ is the consummation of the glorious process begun at the new birth. You have this beginning in Christ and it's working through, working through, working through you. And then he appears and we are made like him. The New Testament scriptures speak of ongoing image transformation. Something that you're at work in now. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 
But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Being transformed now, something that's working in us now, not only something that was begun and, and completed in some sense, but now being transformed. It also talks of completed image transformation that has uh, happened in, in one sense as well. All of Colossians 3 is pointed to this. We'll get there in more detail in a few moments. But Colossians 3.10 for now says that we have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Our Lord is the potter. We are the clay. We are already the sons of Adam made from dust. We already have the spirit of the second Adam living within us. And so what is left on God's agenda for us? What is left? It is for the potter to refashion these bodies of clay, this Adamic clay that we have, this clay that cleaves to the earth, that is of the earth earthy. And just as we have borne the image of that earthy, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. We will be given second Adam bodies to go with the second Adam spirit that's within us. To the brethren at Philippi, Paul writes, this is from the New American Standard, chapter 3, 17 and following. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what's he going to do? Verse 21, who will transform the body of our humble estate, our humble state, into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. In the end of the world, and we're going to talk about those in other sessions during these meetings, not only is there going to be the ending of this world, the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth, but there is also a change in us. We see hints of this in Romans 8. It talks about all of the creation groaning and waiting for our manifestation as the sons of God. We will have this transformation, this body of a humble state. That's kind of weak. King James, our vile body. Our vile body. Oh, maybe sometimes it's pretty and we've decorated and put some makeup on and wear a mask so we don't look so bad. But when you get into the bright sunlight of God's presence through his word, it's a vile body. It's a vile body. Fashioned like unto his glorious body. New International Version says our lowly bodies. American Standard has the body of our humiliation. And you know why it's called that, because... It will humiliate you. You may have the best of intentions, but oh, you still have the body. So you can say, when I would do good, I find that evil is present with me because of the frame that I'm in. Colossians chapter 3 now. The first, uh, the first portion of the chapter. This following passage states very clearly some of the practical elements of being remade in the image of Christ and what changes occur in our life. Uh, Paul, which is typical when he writes, will start off with some uh, doctrinal theology, a, a large view of things, and then he gets into the pragmatics. So verse 1, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, you see the connection to 1 John 3 there, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Notice here, Paul's not talking about body of humiliation anymore. Not talking about a vile body being revealed here. No, revealed with him in glory. Then he talks about the body. Verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, 
anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth? Isn't it remarkable that the great apostle has to write to a church, to a church that's been in existence for some time, this is not new believers, having to write to them and actually say, verse 9, do not lie to one another. He actually has to say that. Actually has to tell them uh, in other passages, let him that stole, steal no more. Has to say that to the church. Why? Because we're in a body of humiliation. We're in a vile body still. There hasn't been the change. And so you have to, you have to sometimes be remarkably blunt. And so we are to also put on other things in this passage. Verse 12, a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and so on. Let me read a, a, a sample uh, from Mere Christianity that describes this change. When troubles come along, illnesses, money troubles, new kinds of temptation, speaking of the new believer, he is disappointed. These things he feels might have been necessary to rouse him and make him repent in his bad old days, but why now? Because God is forcing him on or up to a higher level, putting him into situations where he will have to be very much braver or more patient or more loving than he ever dreamed of being before. It seems to us all unnecessary, but that is because we have not yet had the slightest notion of the tremendous thing he means to make of us. He borrows a parable from George MacDonald. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. That's the change that's occurring. The command, be ye perfect, is not idealistic gas, nor is it a command to do the impossible. He is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command. He said in the Bible that we were gods and he is going to make good his words. If we let him, for we can prevent him if we choose, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we are in for, nothing less. He meant what he said. The change is begun in us already. This change that will have its completion when he shall appear. Let's take a, a, a trip through some of these other passages in Scripture. Uh, I want you to note in these how the return of Christ and the holiness of his people waiting for him are put right by each other. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, toward the end of the chapter. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. God is at work in this change. It is not mere willpower. It is not seven steps to this and four steps to that. But it is God through his spirit working in us, nudging us in the right direction, drawing us, drawing us trying to show us the things that are painful and bad and that we need to stay away from, trying to show us the things that are good, the things that we must hold on to. Here is a stronger passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, very strong passage, verse 6 and following. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Brethren, do you know that the Bible talks like this? 
Do not think that God takes it lightly when his children are abused. It is just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. Amen. Here is a, one other text that is even clearer on this, the Titus 2 passage that has been alluded to and will be frequently, I'm sure. Titus 2.11 for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Amen. Now look at the connection there in Titus 2. We are being taught now to deny ungodliness, to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present day. There are some groups who in history have erred by only having that, only having a moral code, and they forget about the return. They forget about the coming. And so there is holiness for the sake of holiness. And there's no real burning drive behind it. And so, since it's only running under its own steam, it, it pans out. You don't really have anything really comes out of those kind of movements if it's only oughtness, if it's only the you better and you must and why don't you and there's no power in that. But from our text, where's the power? We have this hope in us, this hope of his return. Every man that has this hope fixed on him will purify himself even as he is pure. See, that's the power of any move toward holiness. Now, other groups have erred on the other side. Jesus is coming back and they care about the return, but they don't really care too much about holiness. Don't really care about ah, being ready. Well, he understands and I'm only human and we all make mistakes and, and other such excuses that the apostles don't make when they write to the church. But Paul doesn't write, well, we're all human. Peter writes, he says, you spend enough time in riotous living. You remember how that was. You don't need to go back there. Amen. You spend enough time in the vain tradition of your fathers. You don't need to go back there. That's, that's how they talk about it. They don't excuse our indulgence. In fact, we're told over and over again, don't use your liberty and freedom as a cloak for wickedness. Don't, don't use it that way. So there is the, the, the twin aims in Titus 2. Taught to be holy, taught to be uh, able to deny ungodliness, and yet looking for the blessed hope. Both. That's the power Yes, you have to have the preaching on purity, and God means business when he's making his people into a holy nation. That's not just some talk. He means that. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. He means that. But the drive for it, the goal of it, is that when he shall appear. We're moving toward that point, being fashioned down here to fit in up there. After looking at those texts briefly, I think it is safe to assert that if an individual is not aggressively pursuing personal righteousness before God, personal practical holiness, actually how you do, how you live, if you're not pursuing that, their claim of watching for Jesus' return is suspect. Amen. Because if you know that the master of the house is coming back, you're going to get the house cleaned for his visit. And likewise, to apply this even more broadly, if a congregation... If those that wear the name of Christ, if they are not actively maintaining their holy expectation of the Lord's return, their claim to be Christian is also suspect. We may call ourselves a Christian church, a church of Christ, an assembly of God, a church of the brethren, a church of God in Christ. All fine terms, affirming fine things. But if we are not seriously engaged in the business of holiness, these are merely empty self-titles. What would God call us? Amen. Would he say Laodicea? Or would he say, these are my children? If you love me, keep my commandments. 
We are at work as junior artisans right now. Amen. Junior artisans. We're at work in shaping, in making and creating a piece of art. You could think of it as painting, you could think of it as sculpture, but we have this image, we have this model, and we're all shaping and fashioning one like that model. But we sometimes have a wrong model. And so when you look around and you see the sculptures that are being created in each one's life, you'll have quite a bit of variety. You'll have the continual touching up that is done to the painting, the continual sanding and buffing, trying to get the right shape in the, cult, in, in the sculpture. We read a description of Jesus in the scripture. Not a physical description, but this is what he's like. And so we, we have that model in our mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. And so we're shaping, trying to get our sculpture to approximate as close as we can that model that we have in Scripture. We're looking. But because of our body, because of our vision, there's a weakness. And it is an approximation. And praise God in this illustration, it's not just us that's working. It is the Spirit working in us, showing us what needs to be done. Here's the work of our lives, the one thing we're creating our whole lives. And in that moment when he appears, we're transformed. And all the imperfections that had been worked in because of our weakness are changed. All the things that we got right are confirmed and validated. No longer do we guess if we have the right model, if our picture is right. You all know how you make a sculpture. Everyone's heard this. If you want a sculpture of an elephant, you cut away everything that's not elephant. Just everything that's not elephant, you cut that away. Amen. So if you are working to, to be shaped into the image of the Son of God, you're cutting away everything that's not Jesus. You're cutting it away. And when you first come into Christ and you're just this big slab that hasn't been cut on at all, there's a lot to cut away. And it's easy to pick. Well, swearing, boom, that's cut off. All these other things, wickedness, lust, greed, envy. Oh, cut that off. That's an easy one, easy to identify. Well, then you're getting closer and closer to the image, and then you're a little more careful. What about television, magazines, newspapers, all that's out there? What about this friend or that friend? What relationships can I keep and still be in the image? And that's where the debate comes in. That's, that's where it becomes difficult. What can I keep and still honor the Lord? What can I keep and not mar this image? There are those obvious removables. And then there are the ones where we ask, can it stay? Or better still, should it stay? What remains? Amen. Each of us bear a likeness to one another because we all have the same model, ideally. We're all looking at the same Jesus we find through Scripture and through the testimony of his Holy Spirit within us. But we are all a little different as well. We're, we're kin, but there's distinctions. Why? We each have a different personality. So we have different trials. We have different things that we have to fight. We each are at different levels of maturity. So if you've been in Christ for 20 years, don't judge the one who's only had a year to work on the sculpture. It's not going to be as polished and refined. But brethren, if you've been at this 30 and 40 years and yours looks like a, a preschooler's been working on it, you need to get cutting. Take that hammer and chisel and get cutting, because there's a work to be done. We each also, third, have a distinct challenge in our environment. We have a different personality, we have different levels of maturity, but we also are all in different environments. My work environment is determined by me. I have a secretary, an administrator at the school, and some teachers in the school. That's it. If I don't like my work environment, I can change that. There's a handful of people. But some of you, brethren, are put in places where you, you can't change that environment. You just have to endure that environment. And so your sculpture has a little bit of a different work on it. You have a different challenge in your environment. All throughout uh, the history of the church, there have been different models of Jesus that have been presented as this is the model. This is the standard. There's a time when uh, the model of Jesus as a hermit or an ascetic is the model. And those sculptures are pretty lean. There's a lot that's cut off, and it just doesn't look quite right. And then there's others that might actually have the glutton Jesus as a model that, no, eat, drink, and be merry, and, and he's the Lord of all creation. He wants you to just enjoy everything. And those sculptures are a little 
too well padded. If you're going to make all your argument based on Jesus' presence at the wedding in Cana, you need to do some more thinking. He, was, he said a few other things as well. And don't use his presence at that wedding to justify your own carnal indulgence. And so you have all these sculptures. You have some people who have the model of Jesus as the, the sage, the one who went about saying witty sayings, wise sayings, but never said anything to offend anyone, and that would actually lead to the cross. There's those who have a, a sculpture that when you look at it, is, is, that a, is that an automatic slung over Jesus' shoulder? Is that a machine gun he's carrying? There's a Jesus, the political revolutionary, that he's, he's going to change all these cultures. There's the Jesus that was the, the friend of women. That's true. But you know how people do it today? He was the friend of women and homosexuals and, and any other group that wants to be looked upon as battered or abused or diminished in some way. He's the friend of minorities, and so he has no moral standards. There's that Jesus that is out there, and there's people just busily sculpting themselves into that image, which is a false image of Christ. There is the mystical Jesus, the Jesus that went to India when he was 12 and to Great Britain and other things that people have come up with. And their images look kind of strange too. Is that Jesus with a, with a turban on? Is that Jesus with, and I hope I don't offend, with a dot between his eyes? Is that Jesus sitting in a lotus position? Is that, where did that Jesus come from? They've, they've seen what they want and they've worked it into their model of Jesus. You know, I think Jesus would be like this. And so they shape it. And their model is whatever they want it to be. And he becomes one that has almost no standards whatsoever. He's a great eclectic. He borrows a little from here and there. And pretty soon it's a, it's a pretty ugly model because it's just got every accessory on it. And it seems so strange. Finally, there's last two. Some have an angry Jesus. Their, their lines are cut too sharp, too severe a looking, a sculpture. He rejects everything. He rejects everything. This is not the Jesus of John 8. This doesn't fit with the woman taken in adultery. They have a problem with that text. He's too easy on her, which when you read it, he's not. But that's how they view Jesus, and so their sculptures are harsh. And, and you have to see whether, can we do this? And you do that, you're out. There's a harsh Jesus. And then, of course, there's the brethren that have the warm, fuzzy, blurry Jesus. There is no real definition to him. There is no line to him. And so anything goes. Well, brethren, the day is coming when the full model that we've been approximating appears. Amen. And our sculptures will be tested. Amen. And all that is not Jesus will be burned away, be consumed. Some of these models, brethren, are so deeply flawed that they will be ground to powder. There will be no saving them through the fire. They are so far gone that they will be destroyed. And all the eternal hopes of those that are putting their trust in the false Christ will also be destroyed. There are others where we will feel the fire and we will know the shaping that changes. There will be that time come when maybe the, the sculpture that is the hermit Jesus gains a little weight and maybe the glutton Jesus sculpture receives a final trim. In the end, he that began a good work in you and that was performing that work even unto the end, that work will be completed. He will make the, the final touches. We're doing what we can, but the master comes and he makes the finishing touch on the sculpture. Amen. All that were behind schedule and how this ministers to me will become on time. <laughs> Everything that, that is left that you would do, all those promises. Uh, there's a song uh, that I've listened to. He talks, with every setting sun there is a promise that I have made to him that fails all your intentions and so there will come that time when you are on time and frankly all those that stopped work entirely that gave up on the process the severity is they will be removed the Lord does not permit a work stoppage on this project there is no there is no striking on this I think of Deborah's song in Judges 5 16 she talks about the great battle they've had in Reuben the tribe he didn't do anything about it. She says there was great searchings of heart in Reuben. And I think there are people today that, that see what God is doing, but all they ever get to muster up is a great searching of heart, a, a good intention. 
the American Standard says, a great resolve of heart. Now, I recognize, brethren, this extended illustration is, is inadequate in some ways. All illustrations can't be pushed too far, I know. The spirit of the holy artist is at work in us now. It's not merely our opinion, not merely, merely our view, our, our baggage we bring to the text, and then amazingly we see ourselves in the text. And if we come wanting a mystical Jesus, we can find him if we cut and paste and make our own little Bible. But this is assuming, brethren, that you are bent and yielding to the working of the Holy Spirit of God. That there is your desire to be worked by the master craftsman. That every blow of the hammer, every cut of the chisel is working to his glory. And to be sure, we may, in a zeal without knowledge, cut too much sometimes. We may. And at other times, in, a, in carnal sloth, we may be slow to remove what really offends and what needs to be cut off. We are putting on a new man and putting off the old man. But on the whole, if the master sculptor is yielded to, the work is steadily progressing, and it is oft painfully progressing. The image of the sculpture works in that regard, that it is painful and it is work. We press toward the mark. We seek to apprehend that for which we've ap been apprehended. Brethren, if you've left your first love, you need to repent, to take up the hammer and chisel again, and to do the first works, Amen. and to get back to the business of his likeness in us. If you are weary and well-doing, be not discouraged. The time is drawing close when he that is coming will come and complete the work that is begun in you. Being like him is the great climax of our struggle here. Being like him is the great introduction into our life in eternity. It's great to consider the end of our work. Here are some other thoughts based upon Job. Think about Job. What's the, the running nature of his argument throughout? If I could just see him, if we could just meet, if there was but a daysman between us that could put a hand upon him and a hand upon me, there could be some reconciliation. I could find out why all this is happening. If only I could talk to him. Oh, God appears. God appears in the book of Job. What a grand, powerful entrance. There's these storm clouds gathering. And then he speaks. And he gives all these other questions. I have a few questions for you, Job. Does God ever, in that book, answer Job's questions? No, he doesn't. We know the answers. We know what happened before with the, the devil and him being before God. We know that. We know the end of it, that God did bless Job twice as much as he had before. But in the midst of the story, Job doesn't know chapter 1 and 2. He doesn't know the end either, chapters 41, 42. He doesn't know. He's just in the midst of this. That's where we live. We don't live knowing what's going on before, the, the behind, beyond the veil. We don't know what's happening there. And we don't know how we'll end either. We don't know what God's going to do there to, to make up for what we lack here. We know promises, but we don't know details. Job never has the questions answered. What happens when, when he appears, when God appears? Job's questions stop. They might not be answered, but his questions stop. Because in the presence of God... His questions evaporate. They don't have any real meat to them. Oh, they're tough questions for men. But in the presence of God, the judge of all the earth shall do right. And you trust. Amen. Amen. I love Job's response. 40, verse 1. Chapter 40, verses 1 and following. I Learn this. Memorize this. You may need this when Jesus comes back as your words. The Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Honor Job for that response. He didn't say, boy, I'm glad you're here. I've got some questions for you. There's some people that may persist in that folly at the judgment. I don't want to be in that number. I want to have this as my opening speech. I'm vile. My questions are wrong. You're right. I'm laying my hand on my mouth. I'm not saying anything else. That's Job's answer. Now, when he shall appear, 
When Jesus comes back, most all of our questions will also dissolve, I'm afraid. Have you been in a bookstore, a Christian bookstore? Most of the questions being raised, they are dissolve questions, evaporating questions. People spend their whole life chasing questions that when you get and you, you finally are before the king of all creation, what a foolish question. Does that really matter? You've chased your whole life after this, and then he appears. And you still have to say, I lay my hand on my mouth. Amen. Let us also have Job's desire for change. Job 14, 14. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. That change. That's what we long for. Amen. Revelation 1, 7 tells us another aspect about when he, when he comes, when he appears. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The return of Jesus, brethren, is not a nice doctrine. It's not a gentle doctrine. Not like an idea that maybe you could tell somebody about God's spirit dwelling in you, and maybe you could make that as a, as a nice doctrine. Maybe you could talk about being a good neighbor, being a good worker, a good husband, a good, and so on. And it's a nice doctrine. Nobody's offended by that. Nobody's offended by the idea of you turning the other cheek. That's not an offensive doctrine. But this doctrine to the world, when he comes back, everybody sees him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Consider for a moment the power of his first appearances after he died and rose from the dead. Those first resurrection appearances. He appears in a room. Does everybody say, oh, Jesus, we're so glad you're here. We've been waiting for you. No. He appears in a room, and what's the first thing he says? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Can you picture the scene? Here they are talking, not knowing what's going to happen, worried, maybe some crying, some making plans. Jesus appears in the room, and drinks are knocked over. Meals aren't finished. Conversations are stopped, probably never to start back up again. Can you imagine some of the things they may have been talking about? Then Jesus appears. We're not talking about that anymore. Not going to talk about fishing and what we think our prospects are. Jesus appears. It changes everything. Conversations shattered, frightened, and full of awe. He appeared. The uh, one man wrote of the Mysterium Tremendum. I try to say that every week just so I can keep saying it. This, this idea of the, the immensity of encountering this one who is the infinite, the one who is there and undeniably there. The, the, the time I spent in Missouri would, would take that Latin and make it the willies. You get the willies. Your body just shakes and you feel your insides pitch and grab. And he has appeared. And he wasn't expected. In fact, he wasn't even invited. If you think about it with those disciples. But he appeared. The apostles have just encountered the completely inexplicable. No, no explanations at all. And they are shocked. And yet, they are transformed. The fishermen become fighters. The cowards become captains. The doubters become doers. There's a change when he appears. Jesus did not appear to them as some gentle breeze, some friendly ghost. He appeared, and it knocked the wind right out of the disciples. There's a picture of this I want to borrow from uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. Some of you are familiar with the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Others of you will become familiar. This is where the children have passed through into that land, and they are speaking with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. They do not know about the land of Narnia yet, and so they are going to be introduced to Aslan. They're trying to decide how they're going to save Mr. Tumnus. Mr. Beaver says, it's no good you're trying, of all people, but now that Aslan is on the move, oh yes, tell us about Aslan, said several voices at once. For once again, that strange feeling, like the first signs of spring, like good news, had come over them. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan, said Mr. Beaver, why don't you know he's the king? He's the lord of the whole wood. But not often here, you understand, never in my time or my father's time, but the word has reached us, reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. He'll settle the white queen, all right. It is, not, it is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. She won't turn him into stone, too, said Edmund. Lord, love you, son of Adam. What a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. Turn him into stone? 
If she can stand on her two feet and look him in the face, it'll be the most she can do and more than I expect of her. No, no, he'll put all to rights, as it says in an old rhyme in these parts. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand when you see him. But we shall see him, asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve, that's what I brought you here for. I'm to lead you to where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is, is he a man, asked Lucy. Aslan a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And now listen to Peter's response. I'm longing to see him, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. Now that, for me, captures this idea of the Lord coming, the Lord coming in power, the Lord coming and every eye seeing him, even those that pierced him and all the wor world wailing because of him. He's not safe, but he's good. And for that matter, when he appears, we may have some frightness about us because we are in a, a body that will be changing. Jesus is not safe, but he is good. And you want to make sure that you are on his side when he returns to judge. Yes, a final reference, Luke 12, Luke chapter 12, verses 35 and following. The picture of readiness, to be ready when the Lord returns, to watch, to not allow the house to be broken up. If you remember, there is a servant that is spoken about, verse 43, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Of a truth, I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But if the servant says in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and he shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers." Brethren, how did the Lord appear to that drunken servant? This was not a good thing when the Lord came back and found him drunk and abusive. How did the Lord appear to the ones that man had abused? Our final words. Why is God landing in this enemy-occupied world in disguise and starting a sort of secret society to undermine the devil? Why is he not landing in force, invading it? Is it that he is not strong enough? Well, Christians think he is going to land in force. We do not know when, but we can guess why he is delaying. He wants to give us the chance of joining his side freely. I do not suppose you and I would have thought much of a Frenchman who waited till the Allies were marching into Germany and then announced he was on our side. God will invade. But I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. When the author walks on the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade all right, but what is the good of saying you are on his side then? When you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else, something it never entered your head to conceive, comes crashing in. Something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none of us will have any choice left. For this time it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will either strike irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying you choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance, 
It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. Brethren, when he shall appear, the choices are over. And so, most all of us here have made that choice to follow after Christ, but there may be some who haven't. We need to think. We need to do more than think. We need to respond. For those that wear his name and are walking after him and are seeking to honor him, we make that choice every week, every day. We're deciding whether we will follow him, whether we will submit to the blows of the hammer and chisel as he shapes us, or whether we will stiffen our necks and rebel against our master. Help us to have a heart that is broken before him and yields to the master craftsman. As we respond this morning, I ask that you would take your hymnals and turn to 549, and please stand with me this morning.